All right, let's look to the Lord in prayer and we'll jump into our study this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for who you are and who you've made us to be by joining us to the person of your Son. We thank you that uh, without that union with your Son, we are less than zero, and with that union, we are everything you could ever want in us because we have Christ's righteousness freely put onto our account. We thank you so much for that, and I thank you for the folks who are here today to study your word with me and uh, hope that everything that comes from me personally leaves their minds before the door is closed when they leave and that everything that comes from your word and you I would remain with them for a long time. We thank you for all things, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, over the past few weeks, you know we've been studying different words in Scripture, and the word we came across was gospel. So we're looking at the different gospels as they're given different names in the Bible. And the reason they're given different names is because each one of these good news messages contains different information. And Bible scholars, as I told you earlier, call this progressive revelation. As time went on, more and more was revealed, but not everything was revealed at one time. And God only expected the people who he was talking to at the time with the good news message he was presenting to believe what he was presenting to them. He didn't say they had to believe something that was coming down the road. They would automatically believe that if they believed the first message. Because when they believed the first good news message, they became members of the household of faith. And so those folks, when Christ came, you know, they knew him. Those who knew him, by believing the message that came out before that, knew him. Everyone else uh, needed to learn who he was, which we're going to see today in these various gospel messages. So in our previous lesson, we began doing a short history of the nation Israel and what led up to the second message there called the gospel of the kingdom. And we saw that Israel was given five buckets of punishment or wrath or chastisement, depending on... Uh, whatever you want to call it, but God said they promised they would keep that law contract faithfully and consistently. Deuteronomy 6.25, give us this law, my loose paraphrase, and we'll keep it perfectly and consistently, and you can consider us righteous to the degree that we do it. Uh, that's a loose paraphrase of Deuteronomy 6.25 if you want to look it up on your own. And so, uh, the, Hosea would later say they swore falsely when they entered into that contract. God knew they couldn't keep it, in fact, he had never given them that law contract to tell them how to be good. He gave them that law contract to prove to them they would never measure up to who he is when it came to their performance. And so they, they, he gave them that law contract so that they would see their desperate need of a savior. The law contract was their schoolmaster to lead them to Christ. So we covered the gospel of the kingdom, what, what led up to that. Now we've come to a new message of good news and uh, that new message of good news is um, called the Gospel of God. So the Holy Spirit didn't give these different names uh, for these different good news messages just for fun and so that we would see, well, it's all just different names for the same thing. It's different things in each gospel. And if you have a handout with you this morning, I think you'll see that the different messages in these different gospel designations as we go through them. Uh, so we know that... Uh, in Israel, God would raise up prophets to show them what was about to happen and when it would happen to them uh, as these buckets of wrath began to fall leading up to the gospel of the kingdom. And one of those prophets was Jeremiah, and he had given this prophecy in chapter 23, uh, verses 5 and 6. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. Notice the... Um, they capitalized the, the word branch there. And they did so because they knew later on who this was speaking of. Uh, they didn't, when Jeremiah wrote it, just that he was going to raise up a righteous branch. And a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In the days of this king, Judah shall be saved, delivered, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he should be called, now watch this, the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Sidkenu is what that is. And so all these names of the Lord had meaning. Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Shema, Jehovah Rohi, uh, Jehovah Yira, uh, all different names. Jehovah Nissi, um, to show Israel that this is what God will be on your behalf if you'll turn to Him. They didn't. They turned to false gods, idols, and worshipped false gods. Uh, but He gave them those names when Moses said, Who shall I say sent me? He said, I am that I am. That's his eternalness. He's always eternal. He's there. He's never away. He's always aware. He always cares. He's there, Israel. He'll never leave. 
And then he turns right around and says, I am. I am what? <laughs> I am whatever you need me to be for you, Israel, because you'll not be able to be anything for yourselves. You better cast yourselves not on a dependence in yourselves. You better cast yourselves upon who I am. Cast yourselves upon my name. Think of it as a blank check if you folks like and draw the line after I am what? And you could fill in, Israel could fill in any of the compound names of Jehovah. When they needed deliverance, they could fill in Jehovah Nissi. He would be their conquering hero, their banner. Uh, if they needed healing, Jehovah Rohi. If they needed to know he was there, Jehovah Shema. If they needed to have peace among their, Israel, among their enemies, uh, they could cast themselves on Jehovah Shalom. There were all different names. And Israel was to fill in the name as they had a need and hand that blank check to God, check to God in a manner of speaking. They were to depend upon him and have no confidence in themselves. So there, Jeremiah said, his name shall be called, or he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah said, Kainu. Now the prophet Isaiah gave this prophecy to the nation in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Long before this branches right, uh, righteous branch, rather, whatever, I get my merds wixed. <laughs> long before this righteous branch would ever be born, Isaiah said this, Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. He's going to be a ruler. And his name shall be called, catch the names, all capital letters, Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And he goes on in verse 7 to say, Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. Will Israel do that? No. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this, he said. So the nation Israel could begin expecting a king. That is, if they believe their prophets. Uh, a king who would set up his kingdom on the throne of David. That was in Jerusalem. Only this king would not be a temporary king like all the kings that had come before him. I believe 12 before him. This king's reign would last forever and ever. There would be no ending to his kingdom and his reign. It would be a kingdom without end, as we just read. But if you've noticed, the prophet Isaiah had said that his name would be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Is that what he's called today? What do we call him? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Did you see the name Jesus sitting in that listing? Never had any of the Old Testament prophets said that his name would be called Jesus. Did you know that? All they had known is that this one to come would be their promised Messiah. Uh, Mashiach in, in the Hebrew. Which means anointed king. God's anointed king in fact. Although there's much prophecy concerning this king that would point to Jesus. They were never told that his earthly name would be Jesus. Does that surprise you? Uh, in fact, the J sound in, uh, to pronounce the word Jesus does not even exist in Hebrew or Aramaic. Um, and Spanish wasn't being spoken then. So the name Jesus came about through what's called transliteration. How so? Well, the Greek dictionary says that his name is Yeshua. Yeshua, which was a common Hebrew name during the time of Christ. If you look up the name uh, Jesus, in a dictionary of the New Testament Greek, you'll find the name Iasus, uh, which in the Hebrew is Joshua. Anybody know that? Joshua. A common name in Christ's day, as I said. Uh, archaeologists have actually found that name carved into 71 burial sites in Israel, burial caves in Israel, dating from the time that the Lord would have been on planet Earth. Uh, and there are numerous Joshua's mentioned in the Bible. I'm sure that more than a few have supposed that Jesus was actually our Lord's first name. And that Christ was his last name. <laughs> Such is not the case. We refer him to him as Jesus Christ. But in reality, Jesus was never his first name. And Christ was never our Lord's last name. When Jesus, Joshua, was given a name above every name, it wasn't Jesus. When Jesus as we know him, or as we call him now in the English language, Joshua, was given a name above every name. Guess what that name was? Lord. Lord. Supreme. One in supreme authority. 
So the word translated Christ is the Greek Christos, which simply means anointed or Messiah. Uh, I went through these things to show you that the Old Testament prophets did not reveal that the coming Messiah would ever be called Jesus. Um, this is why our Lord was continually asking this question. Listen to a few of these. Matthew 16, verse 13. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Matthew 16, 15. But whom say ye that I am? Mark 8, 27. But whom do men say that I am? Mark 8, 29. But whom say ye that I am? Luke 9, 18. Whom say the people that I am? Luke 9, 20. But whom say ye that I am? You would think Christ would be running around with the twelve telling everybody he was the promised Messiah. I'm the one the prophets predicted would come or foretold would come. Not at all. In fact, that's what a lot of folks suppose. That his purpose for his three-year ministry as a Jew under law to Jews under law was to make himself known by declaring him to be Israel's promised Messiah. That wasn't the case at all. In fact, he had forbidden the 12 apostles to tell anyone that he was the prophesied Christ, uh, the promised Messiah, as we've seen in Matthew chapter 16, verse 20. Then charged to his disciples that they should tell how many? Amen. No man that he was Jesus the Christ. When could they reveal that truth? After he died, was buried, and rose again. But not until. And remember I told you about uh, Christ casting the demon out of the, the woman at, in, in uh, Peter's house? And the demon said, we know who you are. You're the son of the Most High. This is in your Bible. And he said three words in the English language. Hold thy peace. One word in the Greek, muzzle. <laughs> so he didn't tell anybody that he was the Christ. And he didn't want anybody saying that he was a Christ. Why not? He wanted them to recognize that he was the promised Messiah by what the prophets had foretold would be taking place when the kingdom was set up. And he was doing those things. He said, if you don't know who I am, Look at the works that I do. So they should have seen what he was doing. They'll not say, I am sick, the prophets say in that kingdom. What was he doing? Healing the sick. The evil spirit would be cast out of the land, the prophets said. What was Christ doing? Casting out those evil spirits. Healing the sick. All types of miracles because the Jews were always seeking a sign. So he gave them signs. Is God dealing with us according to sight today or according to faith? So we don't know what he's doing today. We have no idea what he's doing. We can look back and say, wow, he had to be in that. Yes. But we can't watch him do it because we don't know what he's doing. <laughs> and the fact is, the reason he told us we walk by faith and not by sight is because as time winds on, the Antichrist is going to be doing all kinds of lying signs and wonders. All things people would expect a true Christ to be doing. So when something's done that appeals to people today, what do we say? Isn't God good? Did he do it? Do you suppose a lying sign would be done in order to keep people in a, a false belief system where they don't understand what Christ accomplished at Calvary? Where the sins are concerned? And so this is why we walk by faith and not by sight. So um, he told his disciples not to tell anyone he was Jesus the Christ. They should have known him by the works that he was doing. Had they believed their prophets, the link would have been clear. Yeshua, Hebrew name, Jesus, Greek transliteration, was indeed the promised Messiah. He was the prophesied king who would come and reign forever. The one whom the prophets had foretold would set up an everlasting kingdom on the earth. But the prophets had never used the name Yeshua or Jesus to refer to this promised coming king. They have never told the name of the one to come. Uh, when Christ said to the Pharisees, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation, then he went on to say, the kingdom of God is within you. Recognition of his Messiahship was what he was talking about. He wasn't talking about the body of Christ. That was unknown at that time. Some have tried to make the words within you mean among you, but within you and among you are two different things. Within you does not mean among you. What did the Lord mean when he said the kingdom of God is within you? Was he saying that the kingdom that had been promised to Israel is never meant to be a literal physical kingdom in the first place? Was he telling them that the promised earthly kingdom had never been anything more than a spiritual kingdom? A kingdom within their hearts? Which is where the expression, if you want to be saved today, ask him into your heart. Jeremiah said the heart's 
deceitful among, uh, above all things, who can even know their own hearts? So we're going to invite him into the chest cavity, <laughs> into a deceitful place and say, now, live there. <laughs> we had to be made righteous in order for the Holy Spirit to dwell in us, whether we ask him to or not. And to be made righteous, you have to be joined to the person of your Savior. And to be joined to the person of your Savior, you've got to believe one of these gospel messages up here, not all of them, but one of them, that applies to everyone today. So, some people are saying, God never promised a literal physical kingdom. It was spiritual. And we say false. <laughs> if God promised a literal physical kingdom, then he intended to deliver a literal physical kingdom and the prophets are full of what will be happening when that kingdom is set up. So contrary to the belief of our covenant um, theology, friends, Christ was not spiritualizing away a literal physical promise that he'd made to the nation. Uh, then what was he talking about when he said, the kingdom of God is within you? Simply this, it would be up to them to decide whether the establishment of that kingdom would come about at that time or whether it would not. As we noted in earlier lessons, the identity of the king was what the gospel of God was all about. The establishment of God's rulership on earth was at hand, but not apart from their recognition and acceptance of Jesus who had been sent, sent among them, been among them, as being that prophesied king. God intended to prove what was in them when it came to their belief in this king. Uh, by noting their acceptance or rejection of him being the king that had been promised to them. So the kingdom was within them to decide, is it coming now or is it coming later? Are you going to accept your, this man as your Messiah or are you not? Uh, when the king was among them, what was within them would manifest itself quite readily. Uh, whom do you say that I am? Whom do you say that I am? Whom do people say that I am? would be the test of their acceptance or rejection of the Messiah that had been among them. Would they accept him or would they reject him? The good news message, the gospel of the kingdom, you have it on your hand out there, was the good news that the kingdom promised Israel through her prophets was right at her doorstep. Glance at the gospel of the kingdom on your gospel of scripture diagram there. That good news message is about earthly kingdom proximity. Your kingdom, Israel, is at hand. It's right around the corner. It's within your grasp. It's not, uh, it's not about the identity of that king, not in the gospel of the kingdom. The identity of the king was never mentioned because the gospel of the kingdom was being, being proclaimed by Christ and the twelve. And he was telling them not to tell anybody that he was the king. So the gospel of the kingdom had nothing to do with who he was, who that king was. The gospel of the kingdom had only to do with your kingdom, your prophets have promised you is right at your doorstep. What do you have to do to enter that kingdom? You have to change your thinking about the source of your righteousness. You have to repent, change of mind, and be baptized with water as the way God had given that nation to make their law failure confession. So that's all it was about. It wasn't about anything further at that point in time. Christ wanted them to recognize him and acknowledge him as being the prophesied king rather than than him or the twelve having to run around proclaiming his right to that position. <laughs> uh, the gospel of the kingdom involved Israel's acceptance of Jesus as the Christ and a required law failure confession to be made through John's baptism with water. John said, I've come not but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Therefore, meaning that's why I've come baptizing with water. It was Israel's opportunity to make their confession. They failed what they'd sworn they could do. And they had to not only confess that they had failed personally, they had, confessed, they had to confess that no one in Israel had ever obeyed that law contract as they had sworn they would. So it was a law failure confession to be made by the law failure nation. It wasn't a confession you stole some gum on Thursday and you told that little white lie on Wednesday and uh, before that and we won't talk about Friday and Saturday night. It was never that. The only confession of sin you're going to find in your Bible anywhere is the confession the law contract nation was to make that they had failed the contract as they had sworn they would uphold that contract and they hadn't made it. They didn't make it as a nation. They didn't make it as a majority of the people in the nation. If this was a voting issue, it would have been put down quick because no, they weren't making it. The prophets made it. You're going to find that confession sitting in your Bible at least six place, different places. 
And in that confession, it was never what I did, will you forgive me? In that confession, it was, we have departed the law. We swore we would uphold it. And we departed your law. Never in your Bible are you going to find anywhere that believers today, or anybody today for that matter, is to confess their sins. Did you know that? What are we confess to confess today according to Paul? Our Savior. The one who saved us from our sins when he became sin in our place and took those sins upon himself. So the good news message called the gospel of God. Now there's different good news in this. The good news message called the gospel of God which would follow the message called the gospel of the kingdom was not about earthly kingdom proximity but about kingship identity. Now it can be revealed who that king really is. Uh, the gospel of God is the gospel pertaining to God in two different ways. We'll look at both. And uh, it's the gospel pertaining to God, the God-man, first of all. That is, uh, Jesus Christ. Jesus the Christ was and is the visible manifestation of the invisible God. Therefore, Jesus the Christ is whom? God. <laughs> now, let's look at that from a couple different vantage points. Who is God according to Scripture if it's the gospel of God? Uh, this is what separates, by the way, Islam from, from uh, Christianity, so-called. This takes us back to John's words. In John chapter 1, verse 1, a very familiar verse to all of you folks. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, then speaking of the Word that was God, John went on to say in verses 10 and 11, He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not, he came unto his own, a reference to national Israel. They were God's own after God had set the Gentiles aside. And his own, the people of Israel, received him not. Now if you want to put a cross reference in your Bible next to John 1.11, he came unto his own and his own received him not, you might jot down Matthew chapter 15 verse 24 where Christ identified those who were his own. In Matthew 15.24, Christ said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So his own were the children of Israel. He had set the Gentiles aside. He wasn't dealing with them any longer. He was dealing with a nation now. So his own was Israel. He came to the Israelites. He was a Jew under law, born a Jew under law, who came to observe the Jews that were under law and to train them to teach them some things. And what he was teaching them was, you're not doing what you said you'd do. What would forgiveness be like in the age of grace? We're to forgive others even in the same way that Christ forgave us. How much did he forgive us? What were those Jews telling Jesus? How many times do we have to forgive? <laughs> so I've already forgiven that person seven times. <laughs> uh, so while God was working exclusively with and through the nation Israel, they were the children of God, not us. Uh, the problem was the children of God failed to recognize their Messiah. We saw how the Lord had commanded his apostles to tell no man that I am the Christ. Interestingly enough, you'll find the expression tell no man used eight times while Christ was on the earth ministering to Israel in connection with his being their promised Messiah. You see, God was proving what was within them, wasn't he? He was pr pr proving to them their lack of righteousness. If you were told you had to be perfectly righteous, never fail one single time, if you wanted to be a peculiar treasure unto God, a nation above all the Gentiles, a holy nation, and a kingdom of priests, and you were continually going to the temple with a sacrifice where you failed, what should that have taught you? I can't do it. <laughs> I'm constantly having to go back with an additional sacrifice. They didn't learn that lesson. God was proving what was within them when it came to God's anointed king being right there among them. Those who would accept him already knew him. They didn't have to be told a thing. They knew him. But let's look at the gospel of God from another vantage point. Uh, the word of can be used in the sense of pertaining to. So let's read it in the sense of the good news pertaining to God the Father for a few minutes. What was the good news pertaining to God the Father that would have to do with Christ the Son in the gospel of God? Well, let's look. Whose plan was it to send God the Son, Israel's prophesied, promised king, to the earth in the first place? Whose plan was that? That plan belonged to God the Father. Notice what Christ had to say about that in Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. 
Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And the kingdom was his kingdom. So it was God the Father's plan to send his son in the first place. Why would that be good news to the nation Israel? John gives the answer to that in John chapter 3 verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. It was not only God the Father's plan that Christ the Son of God come into the world, it was God the Father's plan that Christ the Son would provide deliverance to those to whom he had come. Luke expressed, expressed it this way in the synoptic gospel bearing his name, Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And what did Christ say? The lost referred to who? The lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, so, the lost was not a reference to all humanity at this point because Christ the Son identifies the lost as being the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So the good news pertaining to God was that God the Father had a plan in mind for the nation that had been promised an earthly territory and an earthly kingdom on this planet. Uh, and that was the nation Israel. And that plan involved the Son of God that God would send to be among those people of Israel. It had been God the Father's idea to manifest himself uh, to man through God the Son. As we like to say, Christ is the vis visible manifestation of the invisible God. It was God the Father's idea that His Son be wounded for Israel's transgressions. And it was God the Father's idea to raise His Son from the dead with numerous scriptures point pointing that out, such as Acts chapter 2, verse 22, where speaking to Israel, Peter had said, Ye men of Israel... And you Gentiles that are sitting in Palmasola Community Church, <laughs> ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved to God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Now watch Peter, watch what Peter's going to tell the people of Israel as we come to chapter 3, verse 26. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus. Now we have a resurrection from the dead, don't we? sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Who was it that raised Jesus Christ from the dead according to Acts chapter 3 verse 26, the one we just read? It was God the Father, wasn't it, who raised him up. Interestingly enough, when it comes to Christ being raised from the dead, there's scriptures showing that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were all three involved in that resurrection of Jesus Christ. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Which is a testimony to what? The oneness of God. Whose idea was it to glorify the Son of God? God the Father's idea, <laughs> once again. Notice Acts chapter 3, verse 13. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his Son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him, Pilate was determined to let him go. The plan, the purpose, the passion, the preservation, all the way up to the position of Christ the Son, all came from God the Father. As far as the position God had in mind for his Son, listen to Peter and John as they prayed to the Father, beginning in Acts chapter 4, verse 25. Who by the mouth of thy servant David hath said, Why did the heathen rage, Gentiles, and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, a reference to God the Father, capital L-O-R-D, really, and against, notice it, his, God the Father's, Christ. So the first Lord there, the kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered against the Lord, should be L-O-R-D in caps a reference to the Father and against his Christ, God's anointed Messiah. So Acts 4, 27 and 28 continue, For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, who anointed him to be the Messiah? God the Father. <laughs> Both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, all three of those were against God, were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. So the position of the kingship of Jesus Christ was God the Father's idea. God the Father had declared his son to be monarch of the earth. 
uh, the Christ, the prophesied Messiah, the supreme ruler. That's a lot of good news directly related to God the Father, is it not? So when you read about the gospel of God, you can, you're reading about what happened to Christ and you're also reading about whose plan it was, the gospel pertaining to God the Father. Israel had the king. Israel had the deliverer. Their deliverer had been crucified, but their deliverer had been raised from the dead and glorified, but there's more, <laughs> as the advertisements always say. Now glance back at the Gospel of God diagram once again. Let's take the identity of Jesus, which is what the Gospel of God is all about, back to Acts chapter 2 for just a moment. We've already seen how Jesus is the Christ, how he is the Son of the living God, how he has risen from the dead, all issues of Jesus' identity, so Jesus had died, he had been buried, he had risen from the dead. By the way, Jesus is the Christ. Israel stumbled at the very first component of the gospel of God. That's where they stumbled. So you're gonna see Paul come along and begin with the gospel of God in every case. And then if they believe who he is, then they'll be able to believe what he's done. So Paul always begins with the gospel of God. He was separated for that purpose to begin there. What had Christ who had not come but unto the lost sheep of Israel, accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection. He had accomplished quite a bit where the nation Israel was concerned. Matthew talked about that in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for all. Thank you. <laughs> and to give his life a ransom for many. That word many there was a reference to the people of Israel. The mystery revealed to and through the Apostle Paul had not yet been revealed. At this point, the gospel of God pertains solely to the people of Israel as far as what had, uh, had at that time been revealed. What had the prophet Isaiah foretold in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 8? He was taken from prison and from judgment and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken. God wasn't dealing with the Gentiles at this point, not yet. Isaiah had foretold what a coming Messiah was going to accomplish for the people of the nation Israel. The people of Israel were the people in focus prior to the revelation of the mystery that came through the Apostle Paul. So the gospel of God had specific application when it was being preached. It was aimed at the people of Israel. We're going to see what happens in just a bit. Now look at component number four in the gospel of God diagram. Component number four tells us that Jesus is what? Lord. Listen to Peter in Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know and all the Gentiles. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified both Lord and Messiah. Both Lord and Christ. Not only is Jesus the Christ, Jesus, God's anointed king, but God had also made him Lord. So what did the lordship of Christ mean to the nation Israel? Well, the word Lord is the Greek kurios, uh, which has to do with supremacy. Uh, look it up in a dictionary. Kurios means supreme in authority, according to the dictionary of the Greek language. So the dictionary says this, as a noun, kurios means controller. It has been translated master and sir, but the idea behind kurios is supremacy. And the supremacy of Christ had special meaning as far as the nation Israel was concerned. Peter explained that meaning to Cornelius over in Acts chapter 10. Keep in mind, the mystery had not yet been proclaimed by the Apostle Paul. So the gospel of God had specific application. And what, who was that application to? The people of Israel. So none of the components of the identity of Jesus of Nazareth had to do with the mystery revealed to the apostle of the Gentiles, not yet. Uh, there would certainly be a grand connection once the mystery was revealed. We'll be looking at that connection in a few moments, but first, let's look at what the lordship of Jesus Christ would have meant to the nation Israel. Peter had gone to the house of Cornelius, as you'll recall, having seen that vision of the sheet coming down with all manner of four-footed beasts, things were unkosher for Israel to partake of all manner of four-footed beasts upon it, things that were not to be eaten by the Jewish people at all. They were unclean according to the law of Moses. That's when God said to Peter, what God hath cleansed, verb tense, hath already cleansed. Peter, don't call that, un don't call that common or unclean. Then Peter's called to where? 
the house of a Gentile named Cornelius. A Gentile who had been a devout man following Judaism. Notice when, what Peter tells the uncircumcised proselyte Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, verses 36 through 42. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say you know, which was published throughout all Judea. How would he know that? Because he was a proselyte to Judaism. He was a devout man, the Bible says, even though he's a Gentile. And began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Cornelius had known that. Verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem who they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. All right, there sits the risen from the dead component of the identity of Jesus Christ in the gospel of God. I think you can see it there. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's risen from the dead. After Christ rose from the dead, what was component number four in the gospel of God? Jesus is Lord. Now watch the Lordship component of the gospel of God follow right on the heels of the He is risen from the dead component as we come to Acts chapter 10, verses 41 and 42. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the living and the dead. Wow. Israel knew that. That wasn't mystery. So while the gospel of the kingdom was solely about the proximity of the kingdom that God promised Israel through her prophets, and not only that, but about their need to confess they hadn't lived up to that law contract, that was in the gospel of the kingdom, wasn't it? wasn't it? The gospel of God was about the identity that promised king for that kingdom. Jesus is the Christ. He's the son of the living God. He's risen from the dead after being crucified and buried and God has made him to be the supreme monarch of the earth, the Lord, the judge of the living and the dead. Did the Israelites know there was going to come a judgment time when they would stand before the king? Hopefully you can see why the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of God were two different good news messages and why the Holy Spirit gave them two different gospel designations in your Bible. Uh, the good news about an impending kingdom and a required law failure confession and the good news of the identity of the rightful king for that kingdom are two sets of good news. Now this is where we need to recognize something very important. Hopefully you can see it on the screen as there's a bit of a change. The gospel of God became an adjunct, an addition to the gospel of the kingdom. What do I mean by that? Well, notice the diagram. The proximity of the earthly kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, was soon to be tied to the identity of the king for that kingdom. And they would work together as long as that gospel of the kingdom was being proclaimed. That link would come after Christ rose from the dead. That link would, since that kingdom had been sitting at the nation's doorstep, it only stands to reason that the nation would have to accept the God-anointed king for that kingdom, the one who had died and risen again for the people of Israel's transgressions. Hopefully you're seeing this. I don't want to bog your minds down, but I want to show you some things in Scripture that you might not have noticed earlier. Had the people and the leadership of the nation Israel, Israel's priesthood, had they accepted their king, their Messiah, and made their law failure confession, that close at hand kingdom could have gotten underway right then. Mm -hmm. I just want you to see how the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the king for that kingdom, the gospel of God, while they were two different sets of good news, came to be intricately linked together after Christ rose again. The gospel of, the, of God and the gospel of the kingdom were like one and the same. The gospel of God followed right on the heels of the gospel of the kingdom and became tied to the gospel of the kingdom as both were being proclaimed after the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And both would continue to be proclaimed until the ushering in of a brand new dispensation or economy, the dispensation of the grace of God upon the stoning of Stephen. Israel had reached what you might think of as her midnight hour to get her kingdom. The clock was quickly winding down for that nation to accept the identity of their Messiah and make their law failure confession. If you recall the parable of the fig tree in Luke chapter 13, 
Christ was at the very close of his three-year ministry to the nation Israel. And, and in that parable, the fig tree, he said, why are you burdening the ground with this fig tree? Cut it down. And what did the chief dresser of the vineyard say, which would have been Peter? One more year. Give it one more year. And if we can get, if we can cultivate a proper response from this fig tree nation, that'll be good. Leave it alone. But after that one year, if we can't cultivate the proper res response, do what? Cut it down. That year came to a close. That year came to a close at the stoning of Stephen. After which the gospel of the kingdom would not be proclaimed again because it was no longer at Israel's doorstep. So the gospel of the kingdom, in effect, dropped off at that point in time because Israel had no more opportunity at that point in time to change their thinking. They did up until the stoning of Stephen because Peter, even in Acts chapter 3, said, he'll send him back. Change your thinking, Israel. Think, change your thinking, and God will send him back. So their kingdom was still on the shelf there, ready for them to accept until they ran out of time with the parable of the fig tree, and that takes you to the stoning of Stephen in your Bible. So at the stoning of Stephen, Israel was out of hope as far as her earthly kingdom was concerned until a time yet future undisclosed. But just because the gospel of the kingdom promised to Israel was no longer at her doorstep, no longer at hand, and the gospel of the kingdom was no longer being preached, that in no way altered the identity of the promised king. So the gospel of God was still very much in place in, in, and in play after the gospel of kingdom was no longer in play. In fact, Paul's gospel, the gospel of Christ, would then be based on the foundation of the gospel of God. So what had been a link between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of God, God began, it became a new link between the gospel of God and the gospel of Christ as the gospel of the kingdom was no longer being proclaimed. I'm rattling your brains, I know that. There could be no completed reconciliation, no justification unto eternal life through union with our Savior, therefore the body of Christ, no Holy Spirit indwelling, and no new creation apart from the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ which was revealed in the gospel of God. But in the gospel of God, when it was connected to the gospel of the kingdom, he died for the sins of, made, became a ransom for the sins of many. Now Paul's gonna come along in the gospel of Christ and say, he became a ransom for all to be testified in due time, whereby I am the due time <laughs> uh, testifier. So now, rather than the gospel of God being linked to the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of God became the foundation for the gospel of Christ. I know this is a lot, but if you don't understand the differences in these new gospels, you will not understand the difference in the gospel of Christ that Paul is preaching. You have to have this foundation set in your mind, and the Bible reveals it. Everything, folks, is inextricably linked to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the sins of the entire human race, as Paul said, as he was sent to proclaim as the apostle of the Gentiles. Uh, and furthermore, through Christ's Calvary cross work, God has reconciled who to himself? The world, not doing what? Not imputing, which means counting, reckoning, charging to their accounts, their sins. Now, if the good news in the gospel of Christ is what Christ accomplished when he died for the sins of the human race at Calvary, becoming sin, answering the punishment for the world because God took that punishment upon himself, and we're now told to proclaim that good news, then where were sins done away? The gospel of Christ. They could be done away earlier, something was needed for that and it was a confession of failure that they failed the contract. The only issue remaining for being justified, righteousified, made righteous unto eternal life is to believe in the all-sufficient cross work of Jesus Christ. Don't stop there. To have put away all sins, the sins of the world, when he died in our place at Calvary, which is what the Apostle Paul calls his gospel, my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Paul was sent out to tell people something. God's reconciled the entire world to himself where their sins are concerned. No one else had ever taught that. 
How did he do that? Those sins were placed on Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. So Paul's gospel has to do pointedly to the putting away of all sins of the human race. It isn't sin. Uh, it isn't a, a taking care of sins that needs to be taken care of now in the dispensation of the grace of God. Those sins have already been taken care of. And they were taken care of at Calvary when Christ became sin on mankind's behalf. So the human race doesn't need forgiveness of sins. The human race needs to accept what God the Son accomplished when he took those sins on himself at Calvary. The sins were gone then. Now if I say, I don't believe they were gone then, have I understood Paul's gospel, the gospel of Christ? This is a serious issue, folks. The only thing God is requiring today in order to be joined to the person of his son, becoming a member of his family, therefore righteousified or justified un unto eternal life, is to believe that Christ put our sins away. Where again? At Calvary. The gospel of Christ is what Christ's death, burial, and resurrection accomplished where mankind's sins are concerned. If you believe that Christ died for your sins, but you refuse to believe that he put away your sins when he was hung upon the cross of Calvary, having become sin in your place, you have not come to understand Paul's gospel called the gospel of Christ and why it's such good news to the world today. And what is the danger in refusing to believe the gospel of Christ? That's very easy, folks. The Apostle Paul answers that for us in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, where our Apostle said, For I am not ashamed of a new different message now, the gospel of Christ. For it, it what? The gospel of Christ is the power of God unto what? Salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul's message was to, he was to tell how many pen, uh, people about the mystery? Make it known to all men. That would include Peter, James, and John, and all the guys that were promised that earthly kingdom when Paul was living. It would, it would include everybody in the human race because God knew about it. I think it's amazing to see what some translations have done to what Paul just wrote. Tell me what has been left out in the ESV, the English Standard Version of the Bible, and the ASB, the American Standard Version, the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, and the NIV, the New International Version of the Bible. Every one of those Bible translations render Romans 1, verse 16, this way. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What? gospel we might ask do you see how some have adopted the gospel of the kingdom and they say well if you're not baptized today by our denomination you're just not saved and where they get it what gospel have we taken if we take the part of Christ out of the verse what gospel are we talking about but guess what the words of in, uh, in Christ are in the majority text they're in the original text the gospel of God, where the people of Israel since were concerned, is where some people go. That's all you have to believe. He died and was buried and rose again. Uh-uh. What happened to the sins he died for? That's in the gospel of Christ, not in the gospel of God. So, apart from believing in the accomplishment of Christ's Calvary cross work, where your sins are concerned, now that the gospel of Christ has been revealed by the Apostle Paul, there is no justification unto eternal life. This is why Paul stated these frightening words in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. For if our gospel, the gospel of Christ, be hid, it is hid to them who are lost. Isn't that frightening? And why the apostle Paul said this in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be anathema, let him be accursed. To you... He's a lost individual. In our next lesson, we're going to take a closer look at the gospel of Christ as we continue to work our way through the various good news messages presented in the word of God. So for now, let's thank the Lord for the good news messages presented throughout the word. And let's thank him especially for the good news message called the gospel of Christ where he revealed what Christ accomplished when he died for our sins. And if you wonder what that is, go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. For he, God the Father, made him, Jesus Christ the Son, to be sin in our place. Christ who had no sins of his own to die for.
so that we might be made as righteous as God himself in Christ. How do you get into Christ? Believe he put your sins away when he died for them and took them on, upon himself. If we say he takes them away when we believe, we're right back to what the author of the Hebrews tried to correct for the Hebrews. They didn't want, the Hebrews had a problem. They didn't want to let go of their sacrificial system when Paul's message was proclaimed. Why did they not want to let go of their sacrificial system? Because their sacrificial system was the avenue for their forgiveness for sins. And they didn't want to drop that. They wanted to hang on to the sacrifice system as a method of forgiveness for their sins. And today we're not hanging on to bringing a sheep or goat or turtle dove to the temple. But what are we hanging on today? The necessity of the forgiveness for sins for people who are yet to be saved as we call it. They need to be forgiven their sins and that message is being preached across the board in every group you can think of today apart from those who understand and see the gospel of Christ. So let's end there. We're going to get into the gospel of Christ more fully next week. But it's a serious issue. Um, not one that can be taken lightly. If Paul's right, if Paul's, what Paul's telling us is right, it's a serious issue, folks. Let's close in prayer and we'll pick it up there in our next lesson and we'll enjoy some, some food and fellowship around the tables when we leave this. Uh, we're going to have a quick meeting, though, con uh, a congregational meeting prior to that. So stick around. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for all you are, for all you've made us to be. And you've made us to be as righteous as you yourself, judicially speaking, the moment we, we trust that Christ put our sins away at Calvary. It's a sin issue. When was that sin issue taken care of in your mind? My prayer is that we all reconcile our minds to what you believe in your mind, that the sins were put away at Calvary. Thank you for that. Thank you for the folks here who have come to share your word. Thank you for the great music today. Thank you for the people <coughs> who were here. You are a marvelous God. <coughs> Pardon me, and we serve a wonderful Savior. Amen. <coughs>